Hello everybody, once again I am Lehman Crafton Jr. aka Zorval Chan, Less Than Guru, and today we're doing a system that I really enjoyed um, called Adventure Quest Jarn. And this was a localized game that was in West Lafayette, Indiana, associated with Purdue, the uh, university, in their fantasy club. The uh, the creator of this game was a student uh, at the university, and then he uh, was no longer a student there, but the fantasy club continued, and as far as I can tell, at least as of 2017, so only three years ago, this fantasy club still is going and still playing this local game. Um, the game, as you can see, the character fits on a card. It's not a character sheet, it's a character index card. But the characters, in my opinion, were just as well-rounded and uh, able to do things as any D&D &D character from any D&D &D system until you start having the, uh, the discussion and debate about feats, whether feats actually add to characters or take away from what characters can do. But that's not an uh, argument for, for now. Basically, we want to make a character. Um, I will be making videos for this system for a review as mechanics, setting, and probably my own experiences since this is a, a game that is localized and not well known out there. So it's not like you can just jump online and see other people's reviews, although the, the very last printing of this is online. The author. Uh, sadly passed away so there probably won't be further printings but his last printing is still on the website and able to be downloaded so if you look for um, adventure quest jarn j-a-e-r-n then you can download the uh, the current which is different than this one but the the current iteration of this game now one of the interesting things with this game and it was again a three ring binder without artwork it was full text uh, this game was a little math heavy uh, Purdue is an engineering school so and the uh, the designer of the game was a computer designer um, he actually is the person who any old old school uh, computer game uh, people were, were talking like Commodore 64 and things like that he was the creator of Telengard the, uh, the old school D&D type uh, game, Telengard. So basically this system, and here it's kind of just as an example of the, the character card, there are a few differences because I added things for my own game. I made the game my own, like I always talk about. So I did add a, a few things. But um, one, one of the things in this game, it's kind of what... I won't say what defines it because I know certain games like I think Warhammer uh, Fantasy Roleplay will you you roll everything including your your race but this is one of those games where they basically thought you in real life don't choose who you want so they didn't want you to choose what your character was you you rolled and let the dice determine everything and then you played that character so um, Basically, you have physical statistics, which are strength, intelligence, perception, common sense, health, agility, power, comeliness, and willpower. Those all get rolled. And just like D&D, &D, um, you get a uh, rank between 0 and 24. And why that's not um, the, the 3D6 is basically because there can be adjustments uh, to it plus you can buy you can use experience points to to raise the uh, oh what I want to say to, to, to raise the various um, at, attributes so basically if we look here it says each stat is generated by totaling the roll of 3d6 opposite strength on the card roll again and go down the line so it's one of those where you start at strength you roll 3d6 and you go down the line so we'll go ahead and we'll just see where the see where the dice fall 
So here I got a seven strength, so I'm probably not going to be any type of fighter background. Any type of warrior does not look like a good choice. Um, here is a ten for intelligence. It's okay, but it's not something I'd really want to be a wizard. Um, perception. There we go. Um, that's a 17. That is pretty good. Am I going to get a rogue? Uh, rogues don't exist in the, the newer one. They become what they call augers. I kind of like this version better, so I've always just kept with this and have not updated it. But that's to each person's individual choice. Um, here we have a 11 for common sense, which would be for a priest. It's kind of like wisdom. Uh, health, 9. Not great. And a horrible, horrible. Agility. Oh, that was a 6 and rolled off. Ouch. 8. So actually, I'm not doing really good there either. Power. Power is how much uh, magic strength either uh, wizard or magic user or cleric priest you can you can get. How how far advanced? Um, there, I got a twelve. So that would be a good priest, a decent wizard, but not a great wizard. Comeliness. Of course, I am. Beautiful, 16. And willpower. Fell off the table. So, when it falls off the table, you roll them all over. At least that was the rule back then. So, I probably should have left those on, but... You gotta stick to the rules, don't you? So that's a nine. Oh, so then you get one placed roll, and this is the thing that kind of helped a little bit. On your placed roll, after you rolled all your stats, you got to roll a d four d six and drop any one die, and then you can replace any of the other ones. So let me go ahead. I'm rolling my four d six. And not too great, but it is a nine. So I either can play, replace my my seven, or I can replace my eight with a nine. Trying to figure out what I want to be. So let me go ahead, and I will replace. my agility with a nine and then what I think I'm going to end up being is probably a priest because my common sense isn't great but it's okay and the power of 12 I remember is high enough to get all the priest spells of a certain discipline so not great, but that's the way the dice roll. Um, the, the, I didn't do the strength because even boosting that up to a 9 wouldn't make me a fighter. And my health is low and other things like that. So it just, in my opinion, wouldn't be worth it. So we did the place roll. Now what we can do is... We can roll for our race. So roll a d20, and let me see if I can bring that closer up so you can see better. That looks like it's working. So they had half races. If you rolled a 19 or 20, you would end up being a half, half race, half breed, and then you would roll again. And if you rolled half breed again, that meant that your your uh, parents were half breed. So you could be up to a quarter of, of different things, and. Um, one of the things um, that the fantasy club did to prevent min maxers was all your roles had to be watched by one of the game masters and initialed. So that was the way that they they kept from people cheating and, and being a, a quarter uh, elf, dwarf, lizard, orc with all the special abilities. 
So we'll go ahead, as you can see, humans are one through 14. That's the, the most common. But I rolled a 20 and actually ended up with a half breed. So now I roll for my parents. So my mama, my mama was an 18. So she was an orc. And then my papa was a three, was a human. So I'm half human, half orc. So I can write human orc. And you could be elf orc or dwarf lizard or things like that. They basically allow any combination. Now I'll go back here and let's see if I can get to that orc. So the orc, my, my mama was an orc. So orcs have four abilities that they might have based on their grandparents. And what you do here is you roll a d4 and if you roll how many grandparents you had or less you got that ability so for the exceptional willpower my my mama was an orc so i had two grandparents who were an orc so if i roll a one or two for exceptional will i, I get that ability So a two, so I have exceptional will. Three, I did not get enhanced smell. I did get uh, physical viciousness. And I did not get mental stubbornness. So for, for those, oops. I think I always we just wrote them under skills we could get I had exceptional will and physical vic viciousness viciousness so I have those written down now we roll our sex so it's a d6, one through three is male, four through six is female. I'm gonna be a female, half orc. There was in the uh, fantasy club, there was a uh, actual campaign date that every, every week you would adjust. So you could figure out your date of birth at that time by figuring out your age. Um, but what you do for your age is depending on what the the race you were maturity was different so what you did was you determine how old your adventure is at the start of his career by rolling one die of the appropriate type for each grandparent again grandparents are what were important so the orcs are d4 so i had 2d4 for my mom and humans are a d6 so i have 2d6 for my dad and then you add 10 to that so the lowest you could be was 14 so 15 17 18 19 20 so my character is 20 years old then you would check your body build so if I'm an orc, I would roll a d20. Nine means that I have a D body build and they just listed letters. And what your body build did was it would determine um, appropriate race on the following. If your adventure is female, oh, is one category smaller. So sorry, so I was not a D, I'm a C. erase that um, height and weight height and weight are determined by rolling 46 and totaling them add the number show for each race of each grandparent so basically what happens here is orcs are plus two so I roll 46 and then and and humans sorry are four so orcs are 
four and eight, so 12. So I'm gonna roll 46 and add 12, and then we'll figure out what that means. So let's take and see what I rolled. 11, so 11 plus the 12 is 23. So if I look over here, go down again, 23 is right here. So my character is 5'2". So over, over here on my character under height, 5'2". And then my weight was C, so I can use my handy dandy character card. And I had a 23C. My character is 90 pounds. And now I roll. Eye color. It says if your adventurer is not pure breed, bred, roll 1d4 to randomly select a grandparent's race. Now roll 1d20 to find it. So basically a one or two will be my mom, a three or four will be my dad. So I rolled a two. So that's gonna be my mom is an orc. So then I'm gonna roll a d20 to figure out my eye color, which is a seven. So a seven on an orc is red. So I got red eyes, red glowing eyes. And then my hair, again, roll a d4. Let's see if you can see that. A three. So that's going to be my dad as a human. So my, my hair color is going to take after my dad, which is a three, which is going to be brown. And then that is all of the randomness. So all my stats were random. I got to replace one. Everything else over there was random. So then I can choose a deity, patron god. They had a list of deities. Um, since I think I will be a priest, I can look to see what type of priest or deity might be good. And they kind of mixed um, Greek, Egyptian, and even um, Norse deities. And then they had a few that were uh, outside of things. But Ra is God of Light. And, and uh, th this was an interesting game because it didn't just separate magic from divine spells like D&D. &D. Each individual deity had their own list of spells that no other deity had. So if you wanted to be a, a healer, you were very limited. You could pick um, Isis, the goddess of life, um, or I believe Osiris could heal uh, mammals. And Neptune would heal reptiles, so if you were a lizard, you needed to be healed by, by Neptune. So those were very, uh, priests were very, very different than, than normal. Um, so we have Ra, Isis, Tor, which is based off of Thor, which is a, a warrior god. I did not have enough good stats for that, so I'm not going there. Um, Athena is for Athena. Basically, that is an NPC type character so we can't do that Osiris is more nature uh, Taurus is a li basically a, li a librarian god so I'm not going to go there uh, Neptune water Horus was god of uh, zeal they did a uh, hate fear anger hate fear and two two more I can't remember what the other two courage and fear maybe um, Anubis, uh, god of dead, 
Rudri was kind of the evil one, and they're kind of vampire-ish. And then you'll see that there's not a number here because the hidden god was Scrog, who was basically the lord of fornication. So basically it was a, a high priest of Horus that started getting worshipped enough to himself. Um, so then he became the god of fornication. So they kind of didn't always publish, uh, publish that. So kind of knowing what I know and seeing my attributes here and kind of remembering what uh, kind of the character class was or the, the gods were, um, I'm going to choose Ra. Ra is a god that um, basically instead of resting and getting spells, they had to spend so much time outside bathing in the sun. And when they bathed in the sun, then they got their spell points back, which were known as SU, spell units. Um, so let's go ahead and go with, see if, see if I can uh, be the, a, a priest of Ra. Uh, basically, here's how backgrounds work. You had warriors, which were combat, magic, which were mages, and skills, which were rogues. And then if you were between magic and skills, you could be a nomad. If you're between magic and warriors, you could be a priest. And if you were between combat and skills, or sorry, magic and combat, combat and skills, then you were marines. Um, marines were the, the water-based sailor type, and it was an important class in this game because this world took place on a, a world um, that was like 98% water. It was, a, a, I believe, a shallow freshwater sea that was basically or ocean that basically encompassed the the uh the whole the whole planet and then based off my intelligence which was a 10 i can look at languages so and i got two two languages to begin with and they have different languages so i'm going to be whatever the paroli is what they considered the the base tongue and then i'll pick orcish um so i can be both uh, my my mom and my dad. So under languages here, I can write Paroli and Orc, Orcish. And I believe um, you got certain levels of them. The first language is Paroli for all human. First language is nine. And I believe the second level was six. Yes, yeah, six. So we go in a, a little, try to get that into focus. Sorry about the camera. Sometimes it just really doesn't want to focus. So right here, um, skill of nine. And then your second one at a six. So I'll write nine and six. And your rating, basically your rating was supposed to be here, this rate. You started off with one. That was about, and it wasn't a specific number. I, in my game, I made it specific up to two decimal places. But in the, the main game, Basically, it's around 2,500 experience, and that's normally what you got in adventure. Sometimes you got a little more, sometimes you got a little less, and that's why I changed it and made adventures. Um, so you would start off with one because you actually uh, had an adventure. And the XP I'm not putting down because that first 2,500 has already uh, been spent. If you pick a template and they had templates you got a bonus to that also which was one of the things that every once in a while rates would kind of get thrown off if you played a, a really good adventure that you got a, a more experience and you did that a few times um, and this was a game that's really interesting because when you get good at the math in it you can look at a character sheet and you can completely calculate what their rate would be and how much experience they spent because of the, the way things were and it was something that it was before character creation was online before there was an online community and people including myself would get really good that with a calculator boom we could we could figure out to you know the 
the hundredths decimal place on how accurate the rate was. But for a starting character, we really don't have to to, to worry about that. Um, I did want to go back to the, the, the two orc things. Um, maybe they're later on. I just remember the, uh, basically you had, I had this uh, exceptional will here. And what that means is you rolled various numbers or various dice that the game master would give you against your attributes. So basically anything that would be a will, if it's against a skill, normally, normally, not always, but normally you'd roll 2d6 against the skill to see if you succeeded. So you wanted to roll low. And against your attribute, you would normally roll 3, 3d6. And if you had an exceptional ability, you got the minus a die. So I would only have to roll a 2. So even with that 9 being low, I would roll one, one less. And like I said, normally it was a 3. So that was a normal task. If it was an easy task, it would be 2. If it would be difficult, it would be 4. And if it was like super difficult, it could be 5 or, or 6. It normally, kept, normally, but not always capped out at 6. But with the orc, I would always get to, uh, to lose 1. And I believe the physical viciousness um, adds to my grapple. It gives me a plus four to my grapple to um, mod, maybe. I uh, have a better chance of, of grappling. But what I'll do is here, I have different templates, and I'm going to look for that, that priest of Ra and see if I can find that. Here's Tor as a priest, so it must be around here. So here is Ra as a, as a priest. Um, let's see if I can. Again, I uh, apologize for the, for the camera. I'm just really not wanting to focus there we go okay so basically there was a long complicated method of how to uh, fill out the, the character sheet but these templates gave you really quick so actually I can't be a well I couldn't normally be a priest of raw you see the strength but what that is is they they showed the short sword and I guess that's what you need so I can just change that short sword um, but the common sense you see is a 10 and mine is an 11 so I, I can be that so basically what you do is you would this character hasn't had anything built into the combat so they had different mods of combat which was like hitting punching or weapons that weren't were not ranged and then missile would be for shooting things or throwing and grapple would be actually to, to hold somebody to grapple and um, but where a warrior might have spent points in it and that's the bonus for, to your d20 just like bonus in D&D but you would spend experience for that and that experience that you spent was dependent on what your background was so my background by picking the priest of Ra um, is up here background right here is going to be priest and this game did not restrict you from being anything else in the future but what it did was it made it more costly to choose things so the priest has a pretty good uh, combat uh, base cost and I'll go into that when I get into a mechanic so you don't have to worry about that now but basically the different backgrounds uh, different things cost a different amount for the different backgrounds so I have no modifiers, but to figure out my defense, I start with a four and then I add agility divided by five and you always round down in adventure quests. So my agility is a nine. So that is only gonna be one point more, or one, one point. So four plus one and then my strength divided by, so that's only a one. So my defense is a six. That means any hit 
above six is going to hit me. This character being a sun worshiper does not wear armor. They basically have to go out in uh, the equivalent of a bikini or um, speedo. So they are not frontline people at all. Um, missile would be agility divided by five, again a one, and perception, which I have a 17, so that's gonna give me three, so four and four is eight. So I am a little bit harder um, to hit with a missile. And then grapple is gonna be a four, again, plus one, and my will divided by five, and my will is the nine. Um, the, the race, I do not believe, counts into it. So that's also only going to be a one. So that is a six. So any type of defenses I have are pretty bad. I'm definitely going to rely on my other teammates, my party members, to help me uh, with that. So then, if I look, I come up with two skills, weaving and swimming, and they're at rank two and four. They call them ranks instead of levels, and you would buy each one of them up individually. So I have weaving, and I always like to, to write the, the name first, and then what it was, and then swimming of a four. So again... If I wanted to try to weave something and the Game Master was like, oh, that's the average, I would roll 2d6. So I would basically have a very bad chance of getting that. But weaving is probably a cheap skill, so I could increase that. Or if it was something super easy, he could just say roll a 1 on and I would have a better chance. And the same thing with swimming. Uh, normally it would be, I would have missed it by 1. Um, but if I would have buy it up another point then I would have succeeded so as you see I don't have weapon skills um, damage points is an 8 so it's a little bit more um, on average of what like a D&D &D character might have a, a basic D&D &D character 20 silver silver was the currency not gold um, and then I get raw spells so basically what it was is there were different types of spell groups within the deity. So there was fabrications, compile, decompile, discorporate, and incorporate. And this meant that I got the first spell in this group, the first spell in this group, the first two spells in this group, two spells, and then three spells for incorporate. And when you add the number of spells you, you get together, one, one, two, two, three, that's how many spell points you have. And the rank of the spell that you cast was how many spell points it took. So I only would have a rank one in fabrication. If I cast that spell, it would take one of my spell points, my spell units. But if, say, I, I did the, uh, the second discorporate, then it would cost two points. And that's how that kind of works. So on the back of the card, let's see if I can go back here. So on the back of the card, I'm just going to write fa fabrications, fabrications. And the highest rank you could get would be your power. And I remember priests could only go up to 12. So having that power means I can get the highest level or rank of priest spells. So my fabrications are at one, compile is at one, decompile is at two, discorporate was at two, and you'll see I'm writing in here. Now I'm up here going to write incorporate. Because if I remember correctly, I'll be able to show you what happens there. So incorporate is three. And basically, this character, um, I get a loincloth, sandals, uh, I won't get the short sword. That was actually too heavy for me and suntan oil. Um, I'll just give myself a dagger. And 
instead. So if I go towards more the end of here, here's something that's inter or maybe interested to you. Since things cost a different amount in this game, they actually had formulas to figure out how to buy up to different levels, especially if you're buying a bunch of levels at the same time or trying to raise something from, say, like a you had it at a five and you wanted to go from, you wanted to buy six, seven, and eight all at the same time. They had this uh, mathematical formula, and it's not, what are you, again, it's, there we go. Whoops. So, <laughs> yes. Definitely from an engineering school. But again, when people played this a lot, they got very good at figuring that, that stuff out. Or you could just always buy it separately. Figure out the cost of six, buy it. Figure out the cost of seven, buy it. Figure out the cost of eight, buy it, except, et cetera. They had a, a cost of buying up from zero uh, for, for DP, uh, how much it would would cost all the way up to, to begin with the to 21 to figure out basically what you were uh, trying to do. Um, again, just to show you the different backgrounds had different costs for combat. So a warrior would have to have what they call a base cost of 200. So to get to a 1, it was 200 experience. To get to a 2, it was 400 experience. To get to a 3, it was 600 experience. But for the Marine, it was 300, 600, 900. Um, for the priest, it was kind of the same for there, but the missile, marines didn't have very good missile, but they had really good grapples, whereas the priests had okay missiles and bad grapples. So there were different costs based on your background. And then basically tells you how you can get spells um, if we look here if I was a mage you would figure out based off of the elements it was elemental magic and so if you're an earth mage the earth uh, spells normally cost 300 but you could also get fire spells but they had a double the base cost so they would start off at 600 and if you got the second rank spell then it would be 1200 and then 1800 etc and then uh, divine if you were an earth mage who went divine it would be three times so basically anything that was a different background usually cost three times as much and if i look here if i'm going divine uh, the divine will cost one and your primary so if I'm going fire, my fire is going to be three and my air is going to be six times. So it can get really high to even get a level one. If I started off as a, uh, a priest of raw and then I went to fire because sun and fire, but I for some reason wanted an air spell, the first air spell that I got on the list would be six times uh, the 300. So that would be six times 300. 600 times 3 uh, would be 1,800 as a base cost, which is quite a lot. So the next thing I want to do is I want to just go and find where Ra is. So I can show you the Ra spells, and then once we figure out the Ra spells, then um, the, the character will be done. So here I have Ra, the bearer of light, and in this setting, if you go by the setting and don't make the game your or the setting your own, he's trapped inside the sun. Basically, he was uh, the the dark goddess, his lover, um, betrayed him and locked him in the sun. Um, so that is kind of that background. But they go through a history and they go through. Um, the motivations that you might have for the deity 
and then the structure of the priest, organization, different requirements that they had, how they go through apprenticeship. So it was very character based. So if you didn't start as a priest of Ra and wanted to become one, you would need to find somebody and do all of these things. And then they kind of had their thoughts on everything. So their thought alone exists in the realm of chaos and just different types of tenets and dogma, um, advancement, clothing, um, how they worship, sacrifices, don donations, obligations, all these things to, to tell you how to, to be the, the raw priest that you want to be. And then their whole thing was based off of light, matter, and ether. Light, matter, and ether, and how the different... The, basically, there, there was a general category for divine, and then each deity came with four groups. And basically, the, uh, they would tell you how these four groups interacted, or, and different deities had, had different ones. So my compile, my very first spell, if you remember, I have uh, one compile is Scald. So basically, you have to get these in order. You can't buy Scald and then decide you want to get Reflect or Sunburst and then do that. So you have to get Scald and then you have to get Light Pinned and then Sunburst and etc. all the way up. So I'm going to get Scald and then Decompile is going to be a Beam Talk. And I think that was kind of like a radio thing that it, a beam of light would would come out and allow you to, to talk to somebody. It has been quite a while since I, I played this game as a Priest of Ra. The last character I played was probably around, oh, 15 years ago when that was an Earth Mage. <laughs> um, I lost my voice at a con and we were making characters and me and my friends were playing this game and uh, I decided to, to be a... Uh, a, a caster that had a special ability that they could do non-verbal uh, casting. Discorporate so I wouldn't have to talk. I mimed everything. That was the only o one and only time I ever lost my voice was at a, a con. Um, discorporate, I get Ankh and Bright Sight. And then the incorporate, you'll notice, 1 through 12. And what that means is normally the priest would get their spell units back, kind of like mages. And I forgot to write, I had 9. Kind of like mages. You would rest and you would get back. But priests of Ra had to sunbathe. So depending on how many hours and stuff you sunbathed, you got points based off of your incorporate rank. So you could get more by re by bathing in sun, but it took up one of your one of your uh, categories to do. And then if I go all the way to the beginning, um, elemental core. If I look for divine core, I think is right here. Divine core magic. Divine core. These were spell groups that were available to anybody. So the one that that template came in was called Fabrications, which would be making things. And if I look here, then create water. So I could create water. And the last thing I kind of want to show you, just to show you how things work, is I'll look at this discorporate here. So I'll go to the discorporate. Um, go back to the, the raw chapter okay so I got onk and bright sight now here you'll notice it has a little F there. That meant finesse, and you could actually, um, you could actually finesse your spells. Uh, you can make them more powerful, but they counted as higher 
rank spells. So here, the duration is two plus one finesse minutes. So it normally would last two minutes, this Ankh, which uh, basically is kind of like a turn undead, it looks like. It makes them hesitate for one round if they fail it. Um, so you'd cast it, uh, and it would could last, I don't know why it says it, why it says they hesitate for one round and then it lasts two minutes, but um, kind of, I guess, ignoring that, it, caught, it takes one round to cast, and they can try to roll 3d6 versus their common sense to negate it. So that's the, the saving throw, basically. The target could be 30 feet away or, 10 fin, uh, or plus 10 finessed. So if something was 40 feet away, I could finesse it and cast it at a second rank skill costing two points, two spell units, because casting it at first rank is one, casting a first rank at two would cost two, and I could get that 40 uh, feet that I needed. And the same, I could make it last an extra minute, or the area radius effect um, is normally, I guess, one, one foot, finesse foot, because it's the little quotation. Um, single quote, uh, one plus 0.5 finesse. So you could increase that radius. I could do any one of those things, but if I finesse something twice, it would bump it up to a three, say. And I don't have a three. I only have a two. So then I would have to make a roll. And if I succeeded the roll, it worked. But if I failed the roll, I believe you lost a rank. So I would lose my ability to cast bright sight um, and that was something that in certain dire circumstances sometimes people would try and they could come up with some spectacular successes where people were jumping up and down because they rolled you know good enough or they could totally horribly fail and lose their their rank and you could even do that with uh, attributes attributes you could try to stress what was called stress yourself and if, if you uh, stressed yourself, you got to, I think, take away a die to that roll, but it automatically went down. So you would have to spend experience to uh, boost that back up. So I did kind of want to ex explain how that worked. But the spells could be very different. So even though you had to go Ankh to Bright Sight, Ankh was kind of a turn dead thing, and Bright Sight was your eyes basically become flashlights. So two different very different abilities but you had to buy Ankh first and then bright sight and then uh, down the line and if you look this one here goes to seven but here it goes to 12. so they could do a full uh, full 12 with the power if i would only had a power of 10 in the future i could only go up to enrage Again, if they uh, enrage. So that's basically how uh, character creation works. It's once you get used to the game, and I try to go a lot more detail into this. It looks like it's coming out in 50 minutes because this is a, not a very well known game. It has the very old school mentality of first and second um, edition AD and D. This was kind of built off of first edition as a response to second edition. I'll say that. Um, and let me go ahead and, and give this this raw worshiper a name. Um, so, and it could be anything. It doesn't have to necessarily be an Egyptian type name. So I will call him Harold. Harold, the uh, and, and here is where you would write your name, Lehman. So Harold, the priest of Ra. Um, so deity, I can write that Ra, and his motive will be sunny. He wants everybody to be happy and sunny and have a sunny disposition. So there was no alignment in this game. There was a motive. And basically your emotive determined how you might react to something, how you might do something. Um, so, And that was something that I first learned in this game. And it's something that I've really liked since then. I think motive is kind of even a better thing of alignment. Because if somebody who's good 
but they have a certain motive, they might start bending their alignment where the motive kind of sets the course of what is most important. And it can always change. So that's something there. Um, don't have the game date. That's where the date would be. Not the real date, but the game date. Um, don't haven't earned any XP. And the profession uh, would be the priest of Ra. So some, some you actually got professions like swordsman or things like that. But profession is I'm an actual priest of Ra. Um, the dagger, I do believe that is just the D4. The, the damage was extremely close to D&D. &D. And again, it was based off of D&D. &D, and a lot of those things were the same. So here's here's my weapon. So type is kind of edged, piercing, blunt type things like that. So if I go to dagger, dagger is a D4 to strike. If I want to throw it, it's a D2. It has a maximum range. And if you impaled somebody with it, how much it would be. So it's a D D4. Um, so I can write one D4. And if I recall correctly, your strength did not, um, your, your strength did not directly affect your damage. What happened is each skill had a associated attribute with it, and that skill could not go above your strength. So if I had a dagger skill, it could not go above my strength, um, or a sword skill. So that would make you want to uh, raise your strength if you wanted to do better. What you got was you got more attacks. For every additional attack you wanted to do, you would roll under against the weapon value. So you'd get one attack, and then if you wanted an additional attack, try to do an additional, you'd roll a d6. If you rolled under it, you got an additional attack. If you missed, then you did not get any of those attacks. So that was something that always gave a little pressure off or people have to figure out if they if they had that 11 and they wanted to get those two extra attacks or no attacks because they messed up it is like I'm probably going to get it but if you roll box cars if you roll box cars you didn't get any attacks whatsoever so there is all types of little things that each of the skills would have based off of it but again uh, day four adventure quest jarn I will do some review videos to kind of introduce the system more if anybody's curious because this is a nice little system and is very flexible they have monster creation rules which were really good and again this is a nice system also it has that old school feel but um, some people might not like the math, but if you, the math doesn't bother you or you like the idea that different skills cost a different amount of experience to raise because certain things are easier and certain things are harder, then this is a nice little system. Characters fit on a card. I actually have a index card box that has characters. Um, Here's all the dead characters. <laughs> so, over the years, lots of people um, have died, both PCs and NPCs. So I can't say that that is. And what the dead character box was, um, I forgot to say, and uh, this is my personal game, but when I was at the Fantasy Club, they actually did have a box like this. And at the end of the night, you would put your, your character card in there and it would be ready for you on the next adventure to find your name, pull out the, the character card and use it. And then the dead people were for game masters. To, if, if you needed a quick stat and you'd be like, I, I'm looking for a, a priest of raw at first level. Well, if, if my character is dead, I can pull that out. And now I have an actor, an NPC ready that I can just have some stats right then and there for. So that was something that was always interesting with those, the small size. You can keep it in a box, carry the box, and you had everybody's character plus any dead character that you can use their stats and reskin it as a um, actor which is what they called NPCs 
So having said that, I'm pretty much on an hour, which is really long, but this is a system that isn't very well known, it's very localized, but one that I, I did like. As you probably saw with some of the terminologies and things, it might not be exactly politically correct or anything, but this is a over 30 year old, um, or close, close, not 91, uh, 29 year old game, I guess you could say. So um, again, I'll go ahead and finish here. If you like, you can hit the like. If you dislike, you can hit the dislike. You can subscribe if you want to subscribe and see more of my content. Um, and the last thing I will say is over the weekend, I am doing something special with uh, Ulysses uh, Spiel for the, the Torg uh, Ororsh wave that comes out, crowdfunding that comes out on the 26th of next week. And one of my days for my character creation is going to be making an archetype um, and showing you because basically the archetypes can be used just as a ready to do character so I will be presenting one of the official archetypes I will be creating it and recording while I create it and kind of talk as I'm creating it and you'll be able to to watch how I uh, make an official archetype so I thought that was neat uh, Ulysses Spiel thought that was neat, so I'll probably uh, post that one around Monday. So uh, stay stay tuned for that. And again, I thank you. I appreciate you watching these. I hope you uh, learned something about this game and the cool put a whole character on a character index card. <laughs>